October's meeting, fourth Sunday, or fourth Sunday, fourth <laughs> Thursday of October. Um, this room is the whole library is taken up with a function on the normal meeting day, so we moved it one week later. So don't show. Well, you can show up here on the third Thursday. You won't do radio. You'll do something with the library. So yeah. Yeah, um, Jason. That th Thursday in October is Square the Square, and they got up here. So you know. Library involved with them. Uh, oh, okay. They didn't. Library. They didn't tell me what it was. They just said. Yeah. Just yeah said, I just yeah. got my library thing today. And you're getting the mail and they, they had it in there. All right. Uh, where did? Oh, there's Ken. Ken, you wanted to make an announcement about the. Yes. So uh, we just got over the Goodyear Half Marathon, and a few of the people in here helped out. I do want to thank everyone in here that helped out with it. Um, went very well, very smoothly. Now we're looking on to the next one, the big one, the Akron Marathon coming up September 25th. I need as many people that can help volunteer with that as I can get. We need about 40 operators to cover the course because it is a full marathon, so it's 26 miles. So I need an operator at about every mile marker, so that's 26, well, 25 right there. So <laughs> if you can help us, September 25th, it's a Saturday. Uh, there is a sign-up on the website, on the ARIES website. It's www.summitares.org. Uh, and there is a map of the marathon course. If you want to sign up and you want to pick a place to actually be on the course, there's a little box, a note box in the sign-up sheet that you can put a note in there say, you know, hey, I'd really like to be at this mile marker. I'll do everything I can to possibly put you where you want to be uh, within reason, of course. But uh, if you want to be at a, at a real late mile marker, you don't have to be there as early because the runners won't be there as early, but you're going to be there later because the last runners will obviously come through later as well. Uh, if you want to be out early, then get uh, pick an early mile marker, and then we can get you out there earlier but uh, please if you can help us on the 25th we can definitely use people September 25th get out this is the only chance we have really you know to show the general public what we do and I know you know the race officials are very very happy about what we do for them and all the racing all the runners they you know they really appreciate us being there for them so that's all I have Yes, Russ. Do you have a meeting before that? We do have an Aries meeting before that, yeah. Yeah, yeah about the race. Meeting. Yeah, it'll be on Thursday evening. It's on four, well, no, it's, yeah, it's in uh, September. And fourth Thursday in September is the race meeting at the uh, Akron Red Cross downtown, our normal Aries meeting night. So, thank you. Yep. Uh, All right. <laughs> Excuse me, Jason. I just wanted to ask Hey, what what uh, is the uh, time of the start of all this, and who do we check with in order to? Um, so the the runners start at seven. If you're at an early spot, you're going to have to be there by six. Uh, roads start getting closed down fairly early. They start closing down a lot of the roads, so you have to make sure you're going to be there before you know roads start being closed. Uh, there is a road closure on the uh, website on the uh, marathon website, and I can put that on our site as well. But uh, if you're going to be at one of the later mile markers, you don't have to be there till uh, maybe 8:39, something like that. But um, what's the station freak? Uh, it'll be our regular Aries frequency, 444.55, 131 on the TL. And yeah, usually they close, start closing the roads before the published times. Uh, yeah, the they sometimes do. It's just the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got stories. On that. All right. Um, up next, picnic. We've got the uh, picnic coming up on the 29th, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Silver Creek Metro Park, which I think most people know, but if you don't know, it's right at the intersection of Eastern Road and um, Medina Line, Medina Line Road. Um, we are going back to the, shelter, the Sherman Shelter, which is that big shelter right off the parking lot where we've had the last couple of picnics. Uh, any Sarah member and their family is invited. We're providing, uh, uh, we've decided on the menu, uh, hamburgers, hot dogs, uh, some bratwursts, then the club will also provide chips and some water bottles. Um, we're asking everyone who comes to bring a dish to share that serves 10. Um, and we do, we are looking for RSVPs. I mean, please try to RSVP. I, if, if you forget and you still want to come, you can come. But 
we're trying to get an accurate count for how much food we don't want to run out of food really um and you sign up online with the rsvp after you submit you'll get a link to go to a thing called sign up genius which is for like signing up for potlucks and stuff like that um we kind of have some stuff there just to so we spread stuff around and have a good variety and we don't all end up with like 75 cakes so that's not too bad though <laughs> it's not a bad deal but, but we are looking for a variety a very right. taste it's, it's not it's not the cake picnic <laughs> It could be. So it could be, but we're looking for a little more variety. Um, so sign up. Um, I Is Scott coming? Yes. You, okay, Scott's coming. Tom Sly, the Ohio sex manager, I might come. Sure. Yeah. Um, but Scott, Scott signed up. Of course, Gary will be there. So. Uh, huh? Worth yeah, it's worth the ticket. So uh, we are expanding the, pit, the picnic a little bit. We've done 50-50 in the past. We'll do a 50-50 again at the picnic. Um, we will be having door prizes this year. No purchase necessary other than your side dish that serves 10. Um, we're going to have 50-50 uh, raffle is going to be open to everybody. Uh, door prizes are for the members. Uh, everyone will get one ticket. Um, we're going to have a Yesu F65R HT is the main prize. It will come pre-programmed for your convenience. Matter of fact, it's sitting on my desk right now. Um, we're going to be giving away two um, dual band J pole antennas, um, which is they're fully assembled. For, uh, well, they will be fully assembled before you, I give them to you. Um, like the ones that we built for the build project in the spring, we had a couple extra pieces because everyone did a great job, and didn't make any mistakes. So we're taking the we're gonna put uh, two extras together. We're going to give those out of the door prizes and possibly some other items. We've got a couple other possible things in the works. So we have a we have a, a two meter 440 uh, compact antenna that we're giving away. Okay, I wasn't sure if we had we that are. for sure. Yeah, okay. we sure. So we'll have a compact antenna, and I have a couple of bags of um, terminal lugs and union splices from Bob Bowen, who wants to distribute them. So if you would like a lot of terminal lugs, get in on the on the door prize. Uh, and actually, it's actually really, they're, they're, we've, we've packaged them up into some little kits for anybody who's building stuff. Uh, forget anything about the picnic, guys? We're going to have a check in. Uh, uh, yeah. Radio two meter on the repeater check in. Yeah. Uh, like the ham fest in the old days. Yeah, like a little check in net. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I guess and there's going to be uh, some, some long games. games uh, yeah. Cornwall. Uh, what's that thing called? Bocce? Sure. Oh, bocce. bocce yeah. Oh, speaking of that, while I forget, Bob has that bocce set. Bocce, I gotta he, pick it up. He needs to pick it up. Yeah. Because he's seeking yeah. nuclear jars. Yeah. I had jars when I was a cat, but they were fine. I survived. Right. Right. We all survived. Right. I only killed one person. Jars. Yeah. <laughs> the jar. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. So we're continuing our new and returning ham focus. Um, tonight, uh, Javen's going to be presenting on QSLing, a ham tradition, where he's going to talk about sort of the what, uh, why, and how of doing QSL cards. Um, and then by popular demand, um, I'm going to talk a little <laughs> bit about the <laughs> – People may regret this, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the FCC rule changes on the RF exposure assessments that all hams, regardless of your power, now have to do for your station. So before the exemption was based on power, now it's not. We'll talk about that, it, but it's an important topic. Um, still hoping to have a September antenna testing day. We're uh, basically uh, set up in a field. We'll get uh, pretty small little... Is it a picawatt or a milliwatt or? Uh, it says one volt. One volt. Yeah. Whatever one volt translates yeah, through. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we can, you can screw on your uh, HT or your mobile. Usually anything that will fit on an NMO mount or something you can easily put on an NMO mount with an adapter. Um, we did it before. It was kind of fun. You get to see just how shockingly good or bad certain antennas are. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Uh, Scott Yonnelly, who is the Great Lakes Division Vice Director and also a member of our club, he's going to be here on uh, September 16th. He's going to talk about 
um, getting involved in amateur radio in general and then specifically with what the ARL does, different programs they have for getting involved. Um, we're going to defer the simple build project probably till January, February timeframe. Um, we're looking at maybe another antenna, uh, maybe a couple other ideas. Uh, on a, in October, um, Eric is going to be talking um, about a practical use of radio. So specifically, he's going to talk about uh, WWV, which is the um, <clears throat> if you have something that says it's the an atomic clock, it's actually a radio that, that transmits from Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, and Eric's going to talk a little bit about kind of how that works, why it's important, and it's a really interesting practical use of radio. Uh, and then finally, on November, we've got Tom Sly, who is the um, Ohio section manager. He actually lives over in Portage County. Um, he's going to talk about um, QRP and portable operations, kind of how you do that and kind of the fun of that, and then why that might be a good um, a good um, time to upgrade the general. And the, then the club with that is actually considering, I don't think we're going to do a full-on class, but come up with some kind of structure to help support people who might want to be interested in upgrading from technician to general. Probably maybe a couple afternoons or evenings we'll just get together and answer questions, you know, those kind of things. You know, we're not, not going to teach through all the material, but just kind of as a way to help and maybe motivate people to get their general class upgrade. Uh, any questions on the new and returning ham focus? No, but speaking of our next test, it's September 4th. So next VE exam is a September 4th. If you want to upgrade or get your, you tech, yeah. or get your tech, or because we had a couple it, people yeah. in the back that said they, so yeah, Sharon said it United Methodist church. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, technical committee update. Uh, a couple things. Um, we are still pursuing the noise with the property owner after a COVID enforced hiatus. Uh, Marty actually has volunteered to take the lead on contacting the property owner. So we're going to send them a letter and see how that goes. Hopefully, they're reasonable people. You never know. Oh, I'm sure. Huh? I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the property in question is fenced off with no trespassing signs every 10 feet. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, it, I, from a distance, it does not look like a compound, but it could be a buried compound. So, <laughs> so um, the other thing is, um, in the last month, two months-ish, um, there's been some problems with 275 with that when 39 transmit. 275 is getting desensed or interfered with somehow. Um, I, we're going to try to swap the amp, but we're talking tonight, it might actually be the pie, so we might try to, we're, we're going to be, basically, we're going to be swapping parts in and out of the repeater system over the next couple of weeks to try to figure out what that problem is. So there will be a couple of downtimes of both 39 and 275 while we swap out different pieces of them. So, um, the other thing was um, we had put a survey out to the club um, after the last meeting to talk about the interest in repeater use. Um, and basically, it came down to kind of the same split we see every time we poll on this topic. Um, we've not made any decisions on anything. This is you know just informational. Um, roughly half of the people don't care if, um, uh, or I'm sorry, roughly half of the people talked about analog. There's about a quarter of people interested in digital, um, and then about 25% didn't really express a preference. Um, so, and then with um, linking with All Star, um, there was um, about half the people had no interest in that, about 20% had interest, and then there was sort of a no preference. If, if you took the survey, it kind of you rank your preference on a scale of one to 10, and sort of if you feel strongly, you get put in the strong interest or no interest and then everyone else is what they in the system is what they call a passive someone who really doesn't have a strong preference either way and then the third question we did put out there after the discussion from the last meeting was use of the board and breaker net um, and that was strongly there was a strong not interest in that so um, as i said no decisions have been made we're going to talk about this at the next executive committee meeting um, the reasons that we made 275 digital have not changed um, you know, it's a place for people to experiment and we don't really need another unused UHF analog machine. 
Um, but the, the, with this, the executive committee will discuss that again at the next meeting. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, in order to uh, make an educated statement or get, uh, understand, get an understanding of uh, what you're implementing for communications, and the mode of communications. There's some of us that have not been introduced to digital or have an understanding of just how, how deeply um, integrated or intricate the digital is as compared to analog. And because of that, our experience may not be up to par to make a, uh, a wise decision or at least a, a, a reasonably acceptable decision as far as how to vote for something like this. So for those that have time in, in, in experience working with it, it would be better to better seasoned, I would think, to help people like myself and perhaps others that don't understand it as, you know, to any great uh, depth. So to appreciate that, we, we need to understand it. Yeah, so, so, there are, so there are a couple presentations on the club site in the archives going back the last couple of years. Um, there's a couple deep dives on DMR. There's a deep dive on DSTAR. I can't remember if we did one in System Fusion or not. We talked about System Fusion, but only at the at the at the upper level of things. So maybe a System Fusion presentation is something we can do. Um, but the, we do have some of that information. But yeah, we can also you know answer questions. What we normally see is there's a group of people who are just not really interested in the digital modes at all, um, and then other people are. I mean, then that's that. This is about what we see with the split every time. <laughs> I can't so, appreciate what I don't understand. Yeah. So. Well, you have 442.275 is there for your pleasure. As long as 39 is not transmitting right now. As long as, <laughs> as, long as, <laughs> as, long as <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the DHF machine is desensing the uh, UHF. Oh, but problems existing with it would serve no purpose to get involved with the transfer on it. It works. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. It's going to be fixed. I'm just saying that that's what that procedure, that's I, why we went digital with that procedure in the first place. Was so people would have, have, have a repeater, have the opportunity right. to experiment with digital. Well, so, I mean, that, that's its purpose right yeah. now. Okay. And, and, and there's lots of pieces of potential future repeater pieces laying all over my basement right now as I'm preparing to swap in and out all the pieces to fix it. So, yeah. Is that uh, is that a good use of uh, you know, these uh, email uh, groups? Is that a good use for the email situation, the digital group? Did it, like did it put questions there? Because I know there's some stuff on the webpage, I believe. It, you know, we we've tried to launch that as a community a couple times, and we've just not seen any persistent uptake on that. I mean. The, the capability there, so what Dave's talking about is we do have the special interest groups, there are email lists, I mean, basically you subscribe to them and then you can email with other hams and they're intentionally designed to be places where you can just, hey, I'm trying to do X, can someone give me a hand or hey, I have this idea. I, I'm all for people using them. We've, we've made a couple pushes. They've not really taken off. If there's a big if there's a if there's a big interest in that we do have the digital modes mailing list what i would say is if you're interested in that sign up for it and you know we need to start some communication questions about how to do digital modes that might be a because that that needs to be an us kind of thing i mean you don't need to be sitting there Right. Emails on all these different groups to keep it out. Yeah, that, that's what we that's what yeah, we've not had is there are questions about well you know, how do we do digital then that would be probably a good place to, to shoot out an email because there should still be people on that list. Yeah, there's still people. And then right. if people would get that email and, and if they take the time to look at it, they can say, Oh, I can help this guy and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think those those are still there. But I think this gives us a reason to, as to why they were put there in the first place. I, I would love to see anybody who's interested sign up. The directions are on the site. It's very easy to go do. Um, and excuse me. And you know, I, I'm not sure yeah. it, um, v, WV3, wait, V3K, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say if you're not familiar with the emails in the website, uh, there should be some information on the WKY website. But there's this email list, and maybe if you, if you have some, you, you come across something you don't know what it means, 
shoot out an email and see who responds because I know there are people who are on that list and you know nobody who does anything on the last because there's nothing someone has them so you kind of kind of have to create a spark and say oh yeah oh yeah I know about that I'll, I'll email them about that or something because I think that it, there's nothing there there's no glow there's no ember but I think what you're asking is is a good way to maybe try to jump start that whole thing Right, and there's there, we have the digital modes list, and there's also the general discussion list, which is sort of the general ham discussions. I mean, there's a lot of people on there, and again, very dormant, but there's a community yeah, out there. So, yeah. Yeah, I want a couple on the list, but you don't see much coming. And I don't have necessarily questions to ask on yeah. that list, but if you see something come across, maybe people will answer. I send a whole stream of my trials with the multi-protocol reflector to the list. Well, I have a personal ignorance. It, it, would, it seemed to me that uh, the only way that I'm going to get personally uh, any information to, to uh, work with, grapple with, whatever, uh, I'm going to need to ask questions, and I need to understand how this all works. That, and, that, and that would be then on the great email lists are the great way to do it because it's the, I don't want to say it's the low and lowest common denominator, but it's the easiest vehicle for everybody to get involved okay. in, and you don't need like special mm -hmm. software. I mean, we've tried Teams, Discord. Telegram, none of them are really mm -hmm. stuck. Um, but you know, the club is here more than just once a month. You know, it's the we, we have lots of electronic collaboration. We just we need to we need the community to participate. So, Gary, I'll often if you put out a question on them and you put it understand or get the answer, there's oftentimes somebody that will get with you one on one. Elmer, if you will, even though you probably asked the stage where you think you need Elmer. But I mean, some of this digital stuff is a lot better with show and tell yeah. than it is just tell. Uh, Dustin uh, had taken some time. Uh, as we were speaking on the radio, he, he mentioned to me that uh, you know, he, he would uh, take some time to get me uh, kind of on the track to so kind of follow through on understanding. Yeah. And we have a lot of people in the club who are more than willing in their areas of interest and expertise to help out people. I just paired up. Um, we have a new ham. Um, she was looking for some assistance, lives in Akron. Paired up two guys who volunteered right away to go meet with her to get her on the air. We have a lot, we have a lot of people who are willing to do that. So don't, you're not putting anybody out. You know, you know that's, that's what we're here for, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. That was all I had. Any other business for the club? Uh, Jason, uh, the Falls Club is uh, involved with a uh, Summit County Metro Parks on the air, oh, which is going to be an activation of the parks and the trailheads on the canal towpath and the hike and bike trails. Okay. So they were supposed to uh, be sending out two local clubs. Okay. Yeah, let me know. That sounds. Is it? Are they doing? Are they doing VHF or UH or uh, well, HF? They're going to be some HF, but also uh, they're looking at doing a lot of the VHF, UHF to uh, include the technicians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll put some stuff up on the website and promote it. We just don't even know about Silver it. Creek ought to be uh, activating the Silver Creek Park. Yeah, we and, could. And don't forget that the uh, Oswego is September 11th too. Oh yeah, State. Ohio State Parks in the area. Yeah, it's on the eleventh. So, yeah, have them get me the information, <clears throat> and we'll we'll put it up. And also, the Ohio QSO party is uh, <coughs> two Saturdays from now. Not this last weekend, like I thought. <laughs> no, not this no, last somebody weekend. Somebody <laughs> published the wrong date in the ARL. Is that what? Is that what it was? Uh, yeah. Because I, I had it in my mind that last weekend was the Ohio QSO party, and I said to Jennifer, "I'm like, we're going downstairs for a couple hours. What do you? I turned the radio on." Dead. Every band is dead. And I'm like, is my radio broken? No, the text went out and said Jason is turning yeah, the radio right now. Off. So I'm like, I'm like scanning around, and then I went and looked at the rules. I'm like, do I have the wrong time? And then I saw, I'm like, oh, it's in two weeks. I'm like, what did I think? And I couldn't figure out why I thought it was last weekend. The uh, ARL published the wrong date. Uh, okay, so I'm not crazy. No, just, well, semi crazy. Well, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm only kind just of a wee bit. Any other uh, business before we uh, move on to the topic section of the meeting? Um, one, one thought. Yeah. Um, I remember, I don't think it was John or Chris that uh, said something on the radio uh, last night. Uh, I think it was uh, about my interest in, in hearing 
on the radio during the Borealis net um, or any of the nets uh, that if, if we could uh, open to not just simply to our, our club, but also uh, since we're so interconnected with all this digital communications and are capable with a talkie to be able to go everywhere, um, would could we not possibly consider through the board or something uh, about implementing uh, a, a, re, a, a reminder of when our meetings are going to be uh, over there over the net over the net so that we have a time and place uh, for those that may not be familiar with it and new hams that are coming on the air that are just getting acquainted with getting on to, to jump into the queue so of, of the net being processed by protocol so I, I I don't know how the borealis net does it because I'm usually in bed by then. It's not that I don't like that. I'm just, I'm just not up. Um, but the the club meetings and that are all discussed. They are announced on the Tuesday night net every month week and um, on the barometer net in the That's morning. That's early in the morning for me. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the net announcements are out there for the Borealis net if they, they can read the same announcements. So, yeah, Fred. I think what he's saying is a new person, right? Yeah. I'm here, okay, so you have to watch for a five minutes. Okay, now, what's the address to the watch for a five minutes? I think that's what he's saying. Yes. The actual physical location. Yeah, you go a new person yeah. might not know. Yeah. Oh, well, wait. If someone new to the area, they might say, where the heck's the watch for? Well, we usually point people to the website because right. the meetings tab has, I mean, it has a link to the map and the address yeah. and the schedule and everything. Yeah. We, we could do that. Well, they say the Wadsworth Library and give the address. Would it yeah. take up that much more time? We, we could do that. Um, yeah. That's just, that's what he's talking yeah. about. You yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. Can you what's, the, what's the power reality that, that is a, it would be every, their net controller would be responsible for putting the announcements together and they're the ones that would have to include it. Yeah, yeah. I know Dustin's one of the net controllers, sorry. I think yeah. it's, it's essentially what Phil is asking is, you know how you put out that announcement on the repeater for like a Tuesday Sarah Club Net? I think he's asking you to put like an announcement on the repeater that plays to remind you when the meeting's going to be and where, that instead of like worry. announcing it during a net, you know, it's just, it like the day of the meeting. We can, we can look into that. I mean, the, the problem is, is we also don't want to, because, so, so the problem with that is you can't, you can't smartly position that to occur outside of communications. So you can only schedule it at a particular time. So if you're in the middle of a conversation, as soon as you unkey and that message is queued up, it's going to jump right in the middle and, and play. So that's something we can take a look at and talk about. It's Most people are get irritated when they have when the uh, repeaters have all these announcements on it. That uh, different repeaters have tried it over the years and have tended to kill it because uh, they're irritating. Yeah, and and that's the thing. We and, and we've experimented with announcements like that in the past, and it doesn't seem to make a big change. Like we've put like field day on the repeater, like for the two days before field day. It doesn't. No one says, "Oh, I can't," because I heard it on the repeater. We we get something we can look at. Okay. So it's it, it's one of those tuning things where it's it's if it was if you could be smart about it and say only play this message when the repeater hasn't transmitted in thirty minutes, but you can't you can't do that. So that's that's where you run into some of the logistics yeah. of that. Because wait till your you people end up doubling what you you announce. Right. Because it'll come on and ID. And it, he, I'm sure you've heard the repeater ID underneath people talking. Yes. And then the I, then the announcement will just continue underneath yes. somebody talking. Because it doesn't know anybody. Because it doesn't know. Right. Yeah. So the repeater controllers have logic in them that if the, if it's transmitting and it has to send its ID, it actually changes it to Morse code, yeah, and it's real right. quiet. Yes. You can't do that with the regular, the regular announcements. It just <laughs> it's, 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 it's the capabilities isn't okay, there to do it. Fine. Tim, what'd you have? Okay. All right. Any other any other business, Marty? Very quickly, I'm missing oh. about five people at least here on the list. Anybody still need to sign in? Yep. Jason, we were going to mention about the repeater this morning with the power outage out of the tower, and that we haven't been on batteries yet. The batteries are 
are there in place and in the wiring. We just have to finish up with that, but we wanted to try to maybe have a discussion or just get it into the minutes and maybe put it on the website that in, in case that we run into that again before we get the batteries hooked up, that the secondary repeater, if the 3 9 is ever down, that it would be 147, 135. Yeah, that's so. What that's that's Marty's repeater in Akron. It's a pretty high-profile machine as well. So if the if the barometer net's ever not on and the Sarah net is, and the Sarah repeater is not on the air like it was this morning, there was a power line failure. Um, ironically, I got to watch it through outage management to see when they were going to fix it. I enjoyed that part. Um, but yeah, then the, the 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 consensus is is the net will hop over to 147.135. So. Didn't that used to belong to Dick Hale, Richard Hale, over at Barberton Hospital? I don't know. But Marty's had it for as long as I've known. The 135 used to be the pioneer. Yeah, it was used to be the PARF, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about 30 years ago. I didn't live here 30 years ago. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if, it's, if it's more than five and a half years ago in this area, I wasn't here, so I don't know. <laughs> All right, last call. If not, Going to throw it over to the 50 50 man. Everybody got your tickets in the bucket? <laughs> All right, get out your blue ticket. <laughs> blue ticket, right? <laughs> okay, the number is, and I can read it tonight. <laughs> 7803-4. <sighs> One, two. Yeah, thanks. Free tickets. Free tickets. Here's seven. See if you want. Draw again. That's close through the telephone. Who got it? Benny? All right. All right. Well, if I put in $100, the prize is 50. Wait a minute. I have 412. What? Do you have a two or you have an also? An also. Russ, Russ, just just go on. <laughs> I think that means we have to split. Are your tickets up? <laughs> you got fixed tickets, man. I got the bigger part. Uh, He's got a tiny nubble at the bottom. That's funny. Oh. All right. Next week, make sure you bring your money. All right. So, so business meeting next is is next business meeting Thursday, September sixteenth. Right back in this room on the third Thursday. Not to be confused with October, which is on the fourth Thursday. All right. With that. Javen uh, is going to talk about uh, QSLing. All right. Do you want to click your own? Or you want me to click them for you? Um, uh, yeah, you can click it. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Hey, Javen. I'm Javen Miller, amateur radio call sign W8UA. And today I'm going to be talking about QSLing. Uh, first off, what QSLing even means. Second, Oops. Oh, sorry. I thought you wanted me to move. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm anticipating your needs. <laughs> <laughs> Second, uh, uh, why you may want to uh, pursue this, and third, uh, how you can pursue this. So, if you can next. Uh, so first off, what does QSL mean? I guess I can look over here. Uh, so QSL is basically a uh, a Q code, which is a short uh, shorthand of a statement. Uh, many of you probably have heard of uh, QRP, which means I have to. That doesn't work. It doesn't yeah, it's not going to work well on the TV. <laughs> QRP, which means I have decreased power. That's uh, just QRP. If you have QRP with a question mark, that means shall I decrease power? So um, and there's several other Q codes that you may recognize. At the bottom, there's QSL, which means I acknowledge receipt of your transmission. So a QSL card is basically a written confirmation or acknowledgement of the contact. Go to the next one. Uh, why would I want the QSL? Uh, 
So basically, you can prove that the QSO was indeed made. So I can claim that a contact was made. But unless I show you guys that I actually made this contact, you won't know that I actually made it. It also makes you eligible for awards. For instance, you could um, apply for like DXCC, which is working in 100 countries. You could apply for that. If you didn't have some way to confirm it, uh, there's no way to prove you actually made it. So QSLing allows you to uh, prove you act, that you actually made the contact. And you can apply for several awards, like DXCC, which is 100 countries, or worked all states, which is <coughs> all of the uh, states in the US, and then BUCC, which is uh, 100 grid squares on VHF, UHF. And so uh, QSLing lets you apply for awards. It's also a final handshake of a contact. If you made a super, uh, really cool contact, and you want to thank the guy for the contact, and want to tell him how much you enjoy that, you might want to uh, send a QSL card and, and tell them that. And also it's tradition. People have been sending QSL cards for probably about 100 years, and it's cool to keep that going. Can I add one point yeah, here? Uh, the other, another thing also, if you really like to work the rare DX entities, mm -hmm. a lot of the DX expeditions, they call them, the people that go out there actually use the QSL card as a way to fund <coughs> their trips. So, and some of these trips these guys take cost insane amounts of yeah. money. So usually they'll ask for like five dollars or ten dollars for the QSL card. I got, I paid one. I just got back from Western Sahara. Cool. I yeah. didn't even know there was amateur radio people in. I didn't know there were people in Western Sahara. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a desert, but. So, so for instance, I just recorded um, Friday tomorrow's amateur radio news line, and um, you'll hear on there if you listen to it on Tuesday's repeat that Bouvet Island was canceled, and um, they're moving it to a different time frame. Yeah. Well, there's so, actually two other groups that right there is it's one provision. split and you'll hear that in the report yeah. yeah but yeah that's that's another reason to do it is to help if you if you like working them that's how they pay for them. yeah so we're going to talk about uh two different types of qsling uh, there's paper qsling which is basically a paper q uh paper postcard which you send just as a postcard and then electronic qsling which is basically a uh type of let's see it's just basically upload your log to a online site and it confirms it electronically, no paper involved, uh, no filling out anything at all uh, gets uh, done there. So you can, <coughs> next slide. So first off, paper QSLing. Um, there's a few pros uh, to this. You know, you can show it off. Uh, with electronic QSLing, it's just a log on the database. With paper QSL card, I can show this, right? I made a contact to Karen Allen. And also, it's an easy way to look back at your QSOs. I put our con ham radio contacts. I put all my QSL cards in like a cookbook or something, whatever this was made for. <laughs> QSL can, cards. Yeah, I can go through and flip back and look at all the contacts I made over the years. And uh, another pro is most people still respond to paper QSL cards. Uh, well, many probably won't send out a QSL card. Um, you know, they will likely. Uh, respond if you send them one to luckily send one in response. Uh, there's a few things. It's kind of expensive to send QSL cards. One isn't that bad, but you know, if you participate in a contest and want to confirm all the contacts, you made hundreds or thousands of contacts. If you uh, that could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to to do that. That's uh, it's quite expensive. It also takes a while to fill out. Uh, one card isn't that bad, but again, if you have hundreds of thousands, that's going to take a weekend to do that. <laughs> a, weekend. a weekend. A long weekend. Yeah. And um, I'm not going to talk about the QSL Bureau much now, but it's basically a way to. So basically, you can send all your QSL cards to the AWRL Outgoing Bureau, which collects all the cards going to a specific country and mails them in mass, uh, like all the cards to Germany. They mail them in one box to Germany. And uh, all the cards to Italy, they, they mail them in one box to Italy. And the QSL Bureau can take anywhere from one to three years. So it can take a long time to get a, a QSL card set that way. <laughs> All right, so here are several different common paper QSL card designs. I'm not going to tell you which one you should choose, but uh, there's many good QSL card printers out there, and, uh, and uh, any one of them should be fine. All right. All right, so there's a few things you should look for whenever you are uh, picking a QSL card. 
Uh, there's several things you'll have printed on the QSL card, like your call sign and your address, your county, your power, and uh, so uh, let's see what else. Um, maybe any club logos. You'll have that printed on the QSL card because they'll never change. Other things, you'll have an entry where you can write that in, like your uh, power, your transceiver, and your antenna, because those are always changing because you always have more than one radio, right? Um, right. Then, yeah. <laughs> And then uh, you'll write in the uh, the person you made the contact with, and the date, and the time, and the frequency, and the RST, which is the uh, signal strength of the station you worked, and the mode, whether that be sideband or CW or uh, digital mode. And then you can see these little check boxes right here: PSC QSL means please QSL, and TNX QSL means thanks QSL. So if you want to send a card, or if you uh, send a card to somebody and you want them to respond to you, you check the please QSL box and they'll send one back to you. If you received a card from somebody and you want to send one back to them and thank them for that, you can just uh, check the TNX QSL. Uh, I think that's it. And you may want to take a station picture, a picture of your station for your QSL card. Maybe your uh, tower. <laughs> <laughs> All right, electronic QSLing, uh, specifically logbook of the world. Instead of sending a paper postcard in the mail for confirming a contact, you can use a electronic service which does everything online. You don't have to mail anything. You don't have to fill anything out. It's cheap, basically free, and uh, it's free unless you apply for an award. Then you have to pay for the contacts, but. Uh, it's fast to upload. You don't have to write out all the cards. You can just uh, click a button and upload the contacts. And the upload feature is actually built into some logging programs, so you don't even have to use a separate program. You also can easily apply for awards from the LOTW website. Uh, you don't have to go to a card checker and have them check all your cards before you apply for an award. You can simply click a few buttons, give them your credit card number, and you're done. All right, um, there's a few cons to this. There's no QSL card display. As I said, the paper QSL card, you can show this off. With that, you can basically just show a few lines of text in the database. Uh, it also only confirms QSOs or contacts with other LOTW users. Uh, you know, there's some rag chewers or, you know, casual uh, participants on the HF bands that might not be set up for LOTW or Logbook of the World and will only be able to send a paper QSL card. So. Um, so you may uh, not be able to confirm every contact on here. All right, so this is how you can confirm your contacts with Logbook of the World. Uh, first off, you apply for a two-factor postcard. Why you don't use a two-factor authentication app on your phone, I'm not sure, but you have to apply for the postcard, wait a week. I'm and just I know why they don't do it. <laughs> yeah, you apply for this postcard, there's a little code on it, and uh, wait a week. And then you can get that twice. <laughs> yeah. Is it the week, Jamin? The week. <laughs> and then you can uh, you can upload or you can enter that code into the site and then apply for various certificates and then wait some more. And then upload those certificates to the TQSL app, which is this app right here, which you use for uploading your uh, logs to Logbook of the World. So how you uh, upload your log files, you just hit this button right there. And it will sign the log and upload it automatically to Logbook of the World. So, uh, again, no filling out cards. You just uh, click that button and it will upload the log. All right, one last thing. Um, beginning of 2020, I had a bunch of QSL cards I was getting ready to send out to the QSL Bureau, the uh, AWRL outgoing QSL Bureau. And I'd asked Jason if if there was anybody within the club that collected cards from club members and sorted them and sent them off in a, in a club uh, shipment to the AWRL outgoing bureau. He said, no, there's not, but James, if you want to do that, you can. So I was going to start doing that. And then of course, COVID, shut down, or COVID stopped all of our meetings. And so uh, now that meetings are starting back up, I can collect QSL cards from club members uh, and I can sort the cards and ship them off to the ADRL uh, outgoing QSL service. And that would, of course, be of no charge to club members. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, so that, that's a service that we get, we want to relaunch yeah. for the club. 
The only caveat is to use the ARRL Outdoor and QSL Bureau, you have to be an ARRL member. Yeah. So that's not our rule, that's the league's rule. Mm -hmm. so. so this would basically just save you time, you wouldn't have to sort the cards. I would be doing it. I would sort all of your cards <laughs> and it would also uh, save shipping costs and also save work for the ARRL because it's easier with a bigger stack of cards versus 10 small stack of cards. Small stacks of cards. So um, you can email me at javen at wa.ua.com and let me know if you know who's all interested. If there's nobody interested, then we can, uh, you know, not worry about this. But if there's any interest, then we'll uh, pursue this. So uh, I think that's the last slide. So where's the barcode taken? Uh, to wawpay.org slash sqb. So <laughs> all right. So that's it. Question. Okay. Go ahead, do you do both? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. There's one thing I was going to say, too, for anybody that is new, because this is for a new topic, people that are just into ham radio, um, that TQSL mm -hmm. piece of software is available for Mac and for Windows. And it's free. And it's free. And after you go through the initial process, a renewal for your uh, um, secure uh Certificate. certificate is very simple. It's simple and it's sent back electronically. It's the first process that they send you a card. You got to wait a week. <laughs> hey, you know what, I made a contact a couple of days ago, and mm -hmm. I got a card, card, mm -hmm. card, card today. That was my very first one. Well, that sounds awesome. like great. Oh, that was a hard, hard call. Because you know, they talk about how when condition was bad, yep. this was no condition. <laughs> now, the guy said, he goes, well, I have a 2.5 kilowatt amp, but I'm only running it at allegedly 400 watts. <laughs> and here I am with a super <laughs> you know, So I was like, okay. Cool. <clears throat> yep, that's great. All right, anything else? Uh, uh, what's that? Where do you get these cards at? Okay, so there's several different printers, like cheapqsls.com is one of them. Uh, KB3IFH is another one. Uh, Photo QSLs. What's that? Photo QSLs is one I use. All right, so there's a ton out there. You could just Google QSL card printers. And you, and, and you can do two things. They'll, they'll have pre stock ones that you just can like they'll just fill in your call sign or you can actually design your own and there's actually people who literally design a card for you there's a whole industry around it that's cool yeah, Dave. yeah there's a whole industry uh I, I, to be honest i bought mine from Brent. i made it myself uploaded the their postcard uh basically took a picture of the top of the gazebo mm -hmm. and you know put in the whole all the all the squares to fill in all the information and all that stuff for mm -hmm. myself because I can see so many of them. You say, okay, this is what I want. For. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were a lot cheaper than mm -hmm. the ham guys. Is that is that QSL picture of yours going to change to the boat soon? No, but I did. I did order a new business card oh. for the boat. <laughs> for the boat. Yeah, I, I, I had a word of business card anyway. Right. Now, you know, so I, I made one for Meg. Cool. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, right here is a great example. I'm not sure how many of you know uh, N3TP Tony. Sometimes he checks into the uh, barometer net. But here's a card he drew himself and uh, had printed. Oh, cool. So, pretty cool card. Uh, looks like some uh, Native Americans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Fred. Okay. Now, I heard about. QS, QSL cards and yep. all that. And, you know, I said, I said, hey, look, if I tell you, I talk to India, mm -hmm. I talk to India. Mm -hmm. there, there's something about them cards, too. Yep. People should understand. I've gotten over 30 of 30 <coughs> cards, mm -hmm. right? Now, mm -hmm. I've sent out twice as many. Yep. You're, you're not always going to get a card. Yep, right? that's true. Uh, you know why? Because they cost money. And yeah. And yep. Everything you pointed out. That's true. Uh, so what so thing, really, in a way, when I sent out these cards, mm -hmm. um, 
because I think maybe the other guy, you know, he might be one of these, oh man, I gotta get the, worked every single station in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if Fred doesn't send me one, a lot of money. man, no one will be able to, you know, I talked to a guy in Ohio. So, <laughs> so it's so important to him. I'll send him the, the darn card, right? Yeah. But I mean, you know, all in all, it's like, yeah, and you know what else? I got a, mm -hmm. uh, some guy sent me a, an email. Yep. Saying thanks for the contact, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you know what? That's just as good as me and some stupid cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, as, you as you said, one but, thing. But really, yep. I got it quicker. You didn't have to pay any money on it for it. So, what the heck, you know? Yep. As you but, said, uh, it's a bad attitude, yep. it's as you good. said, you sent out twice as many QSL cards as you received, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you can check on their QRZ page, QRZ.com, and see if they that. say, I want QSL cards or not. Yeah, you I'm can on see that. that out of 100, <coughs> 135 contacts yep. across Fenway County, and I got the like 32 confirmed. Okay, you know, cool. <laughs> that's how that works. Yep, that's Go ahead. Like, <laughs> I was just wondering what the stupid cards have to have on them. <laughs> the stupid <laughs> cards. <laughs> Is there a requirement for specific information? Um, basically everything I said, except uh, what would you want, like? Spin back to the card picture yeah. so you can just at least see. Yeah. yeah. Like right there. Stuff that you, what, one more. Name, Thanks. time, and location. Yeah. So you yeah. need your call sign. You don't need your county. Your grid. Uh, you don't need the power the radio or the grid. Yeah. Well, you don't need it to confirm the contact. Well, if you're working grids, that's what he meant. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You definitely need the uh, station you're you contacted. The frequency. The time and the uh, frequency. The and, signal uh, report. Yeah. The signal that's report. all that's like necessary. That yeah. is cool. But if, if, you, if you want to have a maximally right. useful yeah. card to everybody who's trying to collect them, you need yeah. your city, your county, your state, your country. Your right. ITU zone, your CQ zone, grid and your square. grid and your yeah. grid square. Yeah, because that that'll cover all of the award class types that people are looking to to, to collect. Right. Now I do have a question. Yeah, what's that? Do you is this strictly for phone or C? Nope. W does this also apply to F? Yeah, so yeah, you can send cards for everything. Um, I think I've even received a QSL card for like DMR or something. So, uh, you know, that's a little bit stretching it. But. That's good. I've, I've, sent, I've sent and received cards for FT8 and D Star, and I don't have to get the D Star. Okay. Yeah. I, I had a great six meter opening one time a couple of years ago in oh, the yeah. summer on FT. I think you were, I think you were on, and I am on that too. Like I got a card from a guy in Western Mexico on six meters over FT8. Just, I mean, it was like weird. It was this weird band opening. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anything else? Cool. Yeah, Javen, uh, hey, what's that? You said you're using TQSL, but most of the logging programs have uh, or some, yeah. built in that, that will do the loading that you don't have to go through the additional step of creating it in a file yeah. for TQSL. Yeah. It yeah, simplifies it. Also, what, on your comment, you ought to add that a flooded basement can wipe out your cards back to 1960. <laughs> sure. Sure. Not that you have not that you have experience with right. that. I have experience. If you if you go back a few slides, uh, yeah, right here. If you read this fine print here, you can read it. Zeke telling that exact story. This was his. Uh, That's flight. Zeke's card. Yeah. Yeah, his first QSL card sent since uh, the flood, right? In the basement. Well, no, I did do. A, I did print a few. A few myself okay. at times. Great flood. The great flood of them. Yep. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Was it the water that got it? It was the black mold. The black mold, yeah. All right. I guess Jason's up next right. with the. Uh, Thanks, Jason. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. So, like I said, by demand, and you will all receive <laughs> some discussion on the um, FCC RF exposure assessment requirements. So, um, before we get started, and especially this later, this presentation is a summary and walkthrough of the FCC exposure rules. It is not complete. 
It is not comprehensive. If you have detailed technical questions, you should write the ARRL Technical <laughs> Bureau because they have real on staff RF engineers who will help you with this, right? So just as a disclaimer, this is not gonna guarantee that you're both A, not going to hurt somebody, or, and if you've got an RF burn, you know what that feels like. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, this isn't a guarantee that you're gonna be compliant with the FCC rules. So just general disclaimer. In addition to what you're saying, low dosage exposure at long-term intervals, it's, in, it's accumulative, it's not repairable. And that by itself merits a lot of care into what you're bringing up here. And uh, the IR5 studies uh, that, that came up from NASA at the time that I was up there, they had shown a lot of this and, and it was also industry concern about the astronauts when we brought projects up on, on mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the ship. So I would say that it's very important, uh, especially where we place our antennas. I, I, I think that probably more people place their antennas not that far from their shack. And we're talking about 30 and 40 feet, which is still not enough considering the kind of power some people think they need to run. And, and that's where you can get into some of the calculations. Right. And, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. So anyway, so so the, the rules that we're going to talk about have been in place for quite a while. I, 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 but for a long time, amateur radio had a exemption based on your license class and the transmitter power. So for most people, most hams, no one had to worry about that. Um, what changed was, with, with, with as Phil was talking about, there's more and more science on, you know, RF energy safety, right? Um, so. The rules were changed a couple of years ago, and they were supposed to go into effect, I think, last summer, but COVID and you know, everything. Um, so the rules changed effectively on May 3rd, 2021 of this year. Well, that makes sense. May 23rd, 2021. So the categorical exemption that said if you're a ham radio operator and you run less than, there's a scale that like 500 watts or something on HF, that, that category, categorical exemption is no more. Um, so starting on May 3rd, any new station or any station that gets modified in any way, you have to have proof and you don't have to submit it to anybody, but you have to retain it. You have to have proof that you conducted an RF exposure assessment um, according to the FCC guidelines. Um, any existing station on May 3rd, 2021, you have two years to conduct the exposure exposure assessment on your station if it has not changed. So by May 3rd of 2023, your unmodified station, you have by the rule, you have to have an exposure assessment done for every radio transmitter and antenna system that you have. Um, there's, you, as I said, you don't have to submit it to the FCC. Um, it's unclear what they're going to do with that in the future. Um, the guidance from the ARRL has been, if you run into any problems whatsoever, <coughs> expect the FCC to come and ask you for it. Um, so it's, it's more of a safety thing, plus in the event you run into a problem, you want to have the paperwork on hand. <clears throat> so, there's two, there's two exposures that you have to take a look at. One of them is called a controlled or an occupational exposure. The other one is a general um, population slash uncontrolled exposure. I'm not going to read through this definition because you all can read um, and these slides will be on the web. But in summary for hands, a controlled exposure is the, is the person or people who are knowledgeable about the topic and can take appropriate safety measures. So there's some debate on whether or not your family, for example, is a controlled or uncontrolled exposure. You are a controlled exposure. The general public is definitely an uncontrolled exposure. 
your family, technically you can train them according to the rules, but part of it is they have to be able to leave the area and can you kick your family out of the house while you're operating the radio, right? I mean, there's some practical considerations. There's no hard and fast definitions, but you have to apply some, some personal logic to, to what you're going to consider controlled or occupational. So like I said, you can, your family knows you do ham radio, but can they leave the house while you're doing it? You know, you get into some gray areas. The best guidance is, other than yourself, is to try to consider everybody else an uncontrolled exposure, which is the general population, right? So this is the safest course of action. Um, this maximizes ability to operate safely. Um, and it helps you think about um, invisible boundaries, right? Um, for example, if you live in an apartment, the wall in your apartment is not an RF barrier, right? Your fence is not an RF barrier. It's a physical barrier, but RF's going to blast right through it, right? So it, it helps you think about um, the correct safety procedures to follow for transmitting. Um, I realize that's kind of vague. Are there any questions about controlled or uncontrolled? Okay. So this question has been asked to me a number of times and other people I've talked to is what is exposure? There's a lot of text in the, in the FCC bulletin on what exposure means. The easiest way to think about it, it's not the most scientifically correct way, but the easiest way to think about it is from any part of the antenna that radiates. So if you have, like I have 132 foot long dipole in my yard, from one end of the 132 foot dipole to the other end of the 230 foot dipole, any point along that, is a potential radiating source, regardless of its shape, direction, anything, right? So it's essentially the distance from any part of the radiating part of an antenna to any part of the body, right? So I kind of put, I, this, this picture isn't exactly what this is talking about, but I thought this was good. So you've got a tower, you've got a person here in the house that's got one distance and you've got a person standing on the ground you know, that's a different distance, right? So I just I put that in there to think about it. So even if you have like a vertical, right, mounted on your garage, but you've got a house right behind you and there's people on the second floor, right, then, you know, you, that's the distance you have to think about, not the distance from you to the antenna. It's, the, it's anybody who is within the distance of that antenna. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and then you'll see this, and I'm just I'm just putting this in here because this this applies to HTs, and we'll talk about HTs at the end. Um, radiation that's closer than 20 centimeters to the body has to go on under what's called SAR testing. So, um, something absorption. I'm forgetting what it stands for now. No one's going to save me on what SAR stands for. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this is this, like, for example, when you hear all the talk about cell phone testing, right? This is what they have to do for cell phones. Basically, you have to like, like measure the 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 HT or the radio from like a thousand different directions and how people hold it in different parts of the body and all kind of stuff. Um, so we'll talk about what that means for HTs at the end. We're for this. We're going to talk specifically about your base and your mobile type stations, not something you've got glued to the side of your head. Do you have a question, Mark? Yeah. What happened to your, uh, not the, uh, in your math is not too good on centimeter. What is that would be in feet or inches or what? 20 centimeters would be eight and a half inches. There's two, two, two point, uh, yeah. five, four centimeters. Yeah. 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 So specific absorption rate. About that far. Yeah, we got to <laughs> Yeah. He got a specific absorption rate. Yeah, thank you. So specific absorption rate. Was that Javen? No, somebody oh, in the back. Okay. Oh, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Oh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the FCC has an RF exposure assessment. Um, there is, a, if you if you get this online, there is an exemption process that's based on the frequency of operation, your effective radiated power, EIRP is your affected, effective isotropic radiated power, but just essentially think of that as the actual power your antenna puts out. Um, and then the distance of the people from the antenna within what's called the reactive near field, which is half of the wavelength of the distance. Um, 
you can use the exception basis, but there's there, but you you might not want to and for two reasons. One, it's not that much more work to do the full calculation if you've already if you've already calculated your system gains and losses. The rest of the calculation is actually fairly easy. That you already have to do the hard part to calculate the exemption. The other thing is the exemptions are based on a worst case scenario. So they're they're very skewed toward safety and your actual exposure might be a much smaller distance than what the exemption calculation will give you. Um, so, and, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so, and, and ask questions, you know, if you have one. So, this is a topic that, that doesn't get a lot of attention unless you really are dealing with your station, is essentially the concept of system gains and losses. And what the system gains and losses essentially means is you, you have a radio. The radio puts out some particular amount of energy. It goes through a feed line. And depending on the type and length of the feed line, you lose energy through that feed line. And then when you radiate out of your antenna, certain types of antennas have gain that will, that will effectively multiply the power that you're putting out. So the system's gains and losses essentially is what your radio puts out minus your loss of the feed line plus the gain of your antenna. That gives you what's essentially called your effective, effective radiated power. Um, so there, there's going to be some math in here. Um, and we'll get to the ARL calculator. And I'm actually working on a project with some other people to even hopefully simplify this for people even a little more. But bear with me on the math here. Um, as with many things in radio, we're talking about decibels right here, which is a logarithmic function. Um, so what you have to do essentially is you take your radio power, you subtract the feed line loss in decibels, you add your gain in decibels, and then you convert it back to watts because math's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so. <clears throat> The, so the, the, these are approximate because um, if you actually do this function on the calculator, you'll get like, I think this is like 17 point some, you know, infinitely long number, right? Um, if you want to convert watts to, to um, BDW, which is essentially a decibel expression of watts, right? You take your, you take 10 times the base 10 log of your watts and you get a number, right? So essentially 50 watts, for example, is, is about 17 dBW. Again, if you when you do this, you'll have to use a spreadsheet or a calculator. Or, yeah. Is there a difference between uh, little b, big b, big w, and little b, big little b, little b, big w? Typos. Yeah, typos. Okay. Typos. I, I just wanted to. This is this is auto like helping more math. It's auto correct. This is auto correct <laughs> helping me. DB is always lowercase d, capital B. So this was this was me not catching a typographic error when when PowerPoint helped me. Sorry for pointing that out. No, you know, you're, I, I want to fix it before I put it up there. Yeah. If you have uh, say the same same length cables and you have the same kind of cables, the same just same the same loss, would that equation be linear? Say if it's 50 watts, then it'd be the same thing on 60, you know, 70, 80, 100. This is just the output of the transmitter. The losses haven't been. Yeah, we, yeah. We haven't got this. This is this is just how you convert watts to dBW. We'll, we'll we'll get to that. And the answer is kind of, but not really ish. <laughs> really ish. <laughs> so, um, for practical purposes, yes, kind of, with some caveats. Um, and then to convert dBW back to watts, it's just it's the opposite of the function. So again, math warning, but you when you do this, you're going to have to learn that little log function on your calculator or the uh, log. I think it's the function is log ten in Excel. Yeah. So, all right. So as I said, the first thing you have to do, and, and this is this is specifically talking about, um, and we're going to see where you plug this in, but the ARRL has released a calculator on their website that I think personally is a little confusing to use. 
So this is kind of to help you develop that information to put into that calculator. So the first, so what you have to do is you have to figure out what your effective power is to the antenna, but not including the antenna. So you have your radio. So let's. So this is this is actually one of my radios. It's an ID4100. Transmits at 50 watts at 144 megahertz. Right. So, and then let's say I have a 50 foot piece of LMR400 coax. Right. So the dB loss at 100 feet is 1.8 decibels. Um, so 50 feet is is roughly half of that. 0 0.6 dB. Now, I didn't go into it here, but every type of feed line have, will come with a chart, and it'll give you a list of frequencies as an upper bound, and it'll say for this frequency, and it'll usually be like 3, three megahertz, 30 megahertz, 300 megahertz, and maybe above, I can't remember what they say for above, um, but basically, you use the maximum number within your range, right? So this is actually the loss of LMR 400 at, I think DXC actually publishes as 144, but not all of them do. Um, so I got this number side because I actually have DXC's LMR 400 and I, you can look it up and it says it's 1.8 dB at 144 megahertz. Now, other companies who aren't really ham friendly won't publish it quite the same way, so you'll have to read through. A lot of times you'll see it expresses 150 megahertz. You just go with that value. Um, so basically what you see here is you calculate the radio, which we already did. You subtract the line loss. So, so when I get to this point, when I get to the end of my cable, and I'm sending it 16.4 dBW, and again, that helped. Um, you convert that back from the last slide. And then so basically what you find out is I'm putting 43.65 watts, roughly, this is an approximation, into the, into the base of this antenna, right? So remember then we have to add back the antenna. So the other thing you have to do is you have to figure out the gain of your antenna. This is going to be the most confusing part of a confusing process. <laughs> So if you're lucky, you have a commercial antenna that will give you a published gain. Whether it's actually the gain or not, they'll actually give you a published gain. So this is, this is the antenna, one of the antennas I have on the roof. It's a Diamond V2000A. I can go to Diamond's website, and it'll say for 6 meters, it's 2.15. For, for 2 meters, it's 6.2. For 7 centimeters, it's 8.4, if you're lucky. If you're not, or if you're homebrewed, there's lots of charts like this on the internet that will give you a rough estimate of what your antenna is. As with all things in this, please choose conservatively and safely, right? If you aren't sure between two values, pick the worst case of the two, right? Um, if you're using beams, yaggies, things like that, this is not for you. You need to actually figure out the, the pattern of what you're sending. Um, again, and if you're at that level, you're probably more familiar with this than if you're talking about like your two meter whip or something like that. Yes, more serious. Yeah. So now I know the gain of my antenna is 6.2 6 dB. So, that then gets added into the system. So if, if we were just calculating the straight loss and gain, right? My station, um, 50 watts, minus 0. 0.6, plus 6.2. I want to say that the EIRP of this is 135. No, that's too big. No, that might be right. I can't remember off the top of my head what this calculation because I didn't actually put it in here. I ran the calculation, but now I don't remember. Eric will figure it out for me in his head. Three dB is roughly double the power. Yeah. So that's twice as bad. Yeah. So it's a little over. Yeah. It's about 40. 40 80, yeah. So 89 80, watts. 101. Yeah. Probably close. Yeah. So, yeah. Then? Um, I'm going to throw a little monkey wrench into this that I got. 
what if you are running your uh, feed line through, uh, say, a couple of delta switches and a couple of watt meters, uh, calculating the losses of the lights? So there's, there's, there, for equipment like a watt meter, there's probably an insertion loss rating that comes with it. Um, Depending on the switches have a loss rating. So yeah, if you have a switch. Calculating that in our B1 calculation as well, correct? Correct. If you if you have anything else in line of your feed line, there you need to account for it, preferably by its published value. Yeah, well, nothing in your feed line is ever going to be a plus unless it's unless it's literally an end. <laughs> Right. Everything in your feed line is always going to be a loss, except unless you're adding an amplifier, but then that's a whole different calculation. Right. You're troubleshooting circuitry or you are doing NIST certification work. That's where that type of detail is necessary. Yeah. So, so, all right. Um, so anyway, to the RF exposure calculator. So if you go to the ARL.org slash RF exposure calculator, all of the things that we just talked about go into this, right? So the first thing you have to put in, remember the first thing we calculated was your power into the antenna. So you express that and once you put that here. We also talked about the antenna gain. So you put, there's a separate box for your antenna gain because we'll, we'll talk about why in a minute. Then you have to put in the operating frequency. So in this case, what you'll see is I've actually put in the top end of the two meter transmit band. So in general, when calculating this, you want to use the top end of the frequency of the band that you're modeling, right? So two meters, you're going to use 147.99 or 148 if you want to round up, right? If you're modeling 70 centimeters, you're, you're doing 449 or 450. If you're doing 10 meters, for example, you're going to put in 29.7. Yeah, 29.7, right? You always model at the top end of the frequency because the absorption at the higher frequencies is more than the lower frequencies. And when you get down into the HF band, some of those eight, some of the fre amateur frequencies, like when you get down like 80 meters, they're really wide bands. Um, so you have to pick a couple other things. Um, the first one is a mode duty cycle. Now, what that means essentially is how is when you're transmitting how much of your transmission is essentially at the full power that you calculated so for example with fm where you have a carrier wave or AM, where you have a carrier wave it's essentially a hundred percent duty cycle because regardless of what other thing you're transmitting your your radio is transmitting all of its power at least on the carrier wave right now ssb obviously is half of an AM with no carrier, right? So the maximum transmission of that can be much less. If you drop this down, there's other choices like RIDI, right? It's usually considered a full, a full duty cycle. CW, I think this calculator says it's 40%. Like if CW 100% would be like if you just sat there and held the key down the whole time, right? But you're not doing that, right? Um, SSB is 20%, there's like a voice modulation that's 40%, but I'm not clear when you pick that one or the other one. That's one of the things I've been trying to figure out in their directions. Um, there's other modes. Again, maximum safety. If you're using an obscure mode that you're not sure how it works, um, like for example, I like to do things like Thor and Olivia and MT63. If you don't know or you can't figure out what its duty cycle is, you should always model it at 100%. For Again, maximum safety. Um, and then there's two, there's another thing in here that's called your transmit duty cycle, your time transmitting. So this, it's expressed in the ARL calculator as minutes on and minutes off. But what you really need to think of it is how much of a percentage of a 30 minute time window are you actually transmitting, right? So if you're talking in a net, right, and all you ever do is talk on a net, right? then you, your transmit time might be two minutes and receive for 28 minutes, mm -hmm. right? Because you only key up one time. If you're in a round table 
on the net, you're probably doing something more like transmit two, listen for five, transmit two, listen five, transmit two, listen five. If you're doing FT8, for example, your transmit time is essentially um, on off like one and one, right? Transmit one, receive one. So you have to kind of think about what your worst case use pattern is of the worst mode that you're looking to model, right? Like if you never use FT8, which is 100% duty cycle, and you only ever use SSB phone, then you calculate SSB phone, right? But FM, 100% duty cycle, AM is 100% duty cycle. Most of the digital modes you want to model is 100%. So you have to think about how you use your radio. What this does is this is actually going into, um, you'll, and you'll see in the results, it's, it's a time averaging calculation. And this is where I said that the exceptions are actually, have a greater distance requirement than if you calculate it. If you don't, if you take the exception, you'll, it's a slightly easier calculation the distances are longer because they're not calculating your time exposure. It'd be essentially as if you went in here and said, I'm doing my duty cycle 100% and I transmit 30 and I receive never. Right? That, that's, so, for example, that's the model of a repeater. Right? No, I mean, in, general, in general, you're not doing that. But the exception assumes that that's the type of operating. I know this is kind of complicated. Is, it, is this uh, making no, sense? It would only be effective if you, if you were at the local site of the repeater during the operational period, that the exposure time would be more dangerous to you and perhaps to others in close proximity. Right. Yeah, Rod. Hey, Jason, just just something to be cautious with though too is a lot of a lot of antennas. The games are is in DVD. Yeah, I didn't it's, think about it's, putting it's, it in. It's related to a dipole instead of an isotropic radiator. And there's right. 2.3 dB difference. Right. So you've got to be careful you get the DBI game, no, not the right. DBD. Right. Yeah. That's, I, I, I'll have to put that in here. That's, I, I didn't, you're right. I didn't think about some of them public in DVD. Yeah. I, I looked at this calculator earlier today because I saw the topic and I was interested and I, I went to visit it. And what you've done today really kind of helped made this make more sense. Uh, I it just listening to some of the comments around here. Maybe revisiting this because we've got a couple of years to do this, right? If you don't change your station, you don't do this. So maybe let's think about revisiting this topic again in, in, in winter or springtime because I, I think it needs it's going to need it a second time. But this is really helpful. So I'm so I'm starting a project with some other people, um, hopefully with the Ohio technical specialists and some other people, of building a better version of this calculator okay. that actually will walk you through each step of the process, even to the point of saying, do you know what your antenna gain is, or do you need help figuring it out? And then hopefully you'll be able to skip back and forth in the workflow. So okay. I, I, I've sent in some feedback on this to the ARRL because I, I think it's confusing. I think to use this, you kind of have to already know what you're doing yeah. kind of thing. Um, I think there needs to be something that's much more approachable. So, yeah, Fred. You said, now, if you don't make any changes, well, who's going to know if you made any changes? You. So it's more on the honor system. Well, right. I mean, you're, I mean, as a, as an amateur radio license holder, you're required to adhere to all of the FCC part 97 and all the other part regulations that apply. Is the FCC going to show up at your door and demand your papers? Probably not. Is this the right thing to do anyway? Yes. yes. Uh, and I have a suggestion and, and, um, uh, since we do have a couple of years, yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, maybe we could, uh, since we all have to show, have someone go around to these different places and say, well, for instance, Fred. You know, and, now, and also, what is the limit? I, I don't, I didn't catch any uh, 
what's the maximum I didn't get that. You're allowed to have? That's 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 his next one. That's the next thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but if someone could come around and say, "Hey, look, let's sit down and figure this out," and help someone who's like Matt, the man who be challenged. I never did trigonometry very much. Yeah, so the issue there, it's something we've kicked around, and I think this is even where the league is stuck, is the liability, right? Oh, I mean, it's, no. it's it, it would still be up to the, the person at that station, right? It's like if I pay someone to do my taxes, and they screw my taxes up, I'm still responsible. Yeah, but you can turn around and see your tax preparer. You could. Yeah, but you're responsible for your, in that example, though, and just like the FCC, you're responsible to the FCC, but you can turn around and push liability down the person. No, 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 you just sign a statement saying you will not hold anybody liable that's yourself. Yeah, you still end up in court. Because, <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, like that, 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 let, let me, sorry, it's not going to show up in yeah. but, Rena, let me Let me finish this because we, we are running out of time here. So, so going back then to what we first started talking about with your controlled versus your uncontrolled exposure. So as we said, controlled is you, uncontrolled, best case scenario, everybody else, you got to salt the taste, right? Um, so with the calculation that we went through, the calculator will tell you that for the controlled environment, which is me, the minimum safe distance of my antenna while transmitting is 3.6470 feet or 1.116 meters. Um, maximum allowed power down, or, um, for the uncontrolled, um, 8.1 feet, 2.4 meters, right? So an interesting thing that I thought about this is at my house, my main antenna is fine, but actually the antenna that I use for the D APRS I gate is actually right over the breezeway between my garage and my, um, and my back door and it's definitely closer than 8.1 feet to people so i'm actually based on this i'm actually going to move put that up i'm actually going to strap a mast to where i have it and put it up another 10 feet and some hazard tape around there. yeah maybe some hazard tape <laughs> so this equation gives you the minimum distances when you when you fill out this form and you hit set calculate you get this back now you know how far away Correct. And, and, and the thing to keep in mind is this scales up with power, right? So if, if I did this for 100 watts on 10 meters or 6 meters at full duty cycle, this is going to be a larger distance because the power is higher, right? And then also when you move up the bands with the, with the skin absorption, the higher frequencies are actually more dangerous than lower. Actually, 2 meters is worse than HF. UHF is even different. So that's why you have to calculate for each band. Yes, frequency, power, and yeah. distance makes a big difference in how affect our tissue. Yeah. So just one real quick word, and then with the last five minutes, I'll take any questions. Um, one of the questions that get asked is about HTs, right? So weirdly enough, the way that the FCC rules are written, the, there's an interesting problem with two meter HTs in that two meters HTs actually require the SAR testing that no ham radio company currently does for their HTs. <laughs> <laughs> so the FCC has stated that anything that exists now is essentially grandfathered. So any model that you have now is grandfathered, but in the future, as new models come out, you'll start to actually see the SAR testing and the published data come out on ham HTs the same way you do with cell phones, land mobile radios in certain cases, you know, things like that. So, so just, I know that's come up a couple times too. So, cool. yeah, Eric. So after, after the May days, and the manufacturers have to have the SAR test, that's gonna be done with a particular antenna change the antenna and that's no longer valid. Correct. And that's some of the things that the ARL is actually trying to get clarification from the FCC on is what is how is that actually going to work? Like, we're in for that example, with using the dipole antenna that we have by HT, that's kind of a different. 
Right, but in that case, though, so in that example, though, the radiator is not within 20 centimeters of you. Right. Right, so the issue is if you take, like, the stuck rubber duck off of your antenna, off of your HT, and put a higher gain antenna and stick it on your head, yeah, yes, <laughs> like that, <laughs> right? So, so, so I, I put this in here just because, especially for HTs, there's going to be a lot of evolving of how hands deal with HTs in, in the marketplace because of those issues. They have to do SAR testing. What do you do with the SAR testing if you want to take the antenna off? Are they going to stop letting you take the antenna? I mean, there's it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Yesu will come out with its own line of antennas that you can use. I mean, and the other thing that's going to be really interesting, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the um, the budget radios, like the Bofangs. Like, I'm kind of thinking Bofang is not going to do an SAR test of their UB5R and the handbands. Or at least they'll give you a document that said they did. Well, a lot of those radios, too, as cheap as they are, come with a lot of uh, transmits various emissions that are not acceptable by the FCC. So they may very well shut them down from being uh, exported from the other countries. They're already technically banned. Yeah. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> there's too many topics here. What, Mark? I said there's too many topics to come up, yeah. like you're saying. Every little, it's like trying to divide a piece of property. No way can you figure out which way to divide it because everyone's going to ask for a different. And that's the same thing here. There's too much stuff, like you're saying, out yeah. there to even. Yeah. They're sort of opening a can of worms. Well, the CAN has been open. The amateur radio community has been allowed to ignore the CAN. Now you can't ignore the CAN anymore. So, any last questions? We got about five minutes. Yeah. I have to register. What's a mod? If I, if I exchange 100 watt radio for another 100 watt radio, is that a modification? Technically, yes. So, all well, this two years it does not necessarily right. exist. Yeah. If we upgrade our station in any way. Yeah. Not just a matter of changing anything. That's the, by the letter of the rule, if you do that, you've modified your station. Now, from a practical perspective, the calculation will come up the same. By the letter of the rule, that's a modification you would have so to do. So you'd have to fill out and do pay for it and just say the same thing. Right. Yeah. So I guess mine are kind of, I've got two and they're both kind of theoretical. Uh, how do we handle field day? Care for you. Okay, that's kind of what I was thinking we were going to go with, but yeah. Um, and then the other one is just an observation. I work in, in security with alarm panels that deal with cell phones, guards to communicate and stuff, yeah. and some of those antennas are pretty uh, interesting. <laughs> so uh, I know I've gotten a bulletin here in the last six months or a year about one of our panels dealing with SAR tests. So, I think I'm going to have to go back and do a little more research on that. And anything that's in the commercial space like that should have should have come with the paper. Like we're like we're doing a, an AHF emergency radio system at work, and like we actually paid someone to do yeah. a test for us. I think the stuff that I've gotten is is the test results. That's that's most of what you got. I kind of looked at it. When, oh, okay, it's something for engineering. I'll worry about that later, and I yeah. never go back and look. Well, but that, so where that comes into play, it's the same thing there, right? Yeah. In a commercial environment, you'd have a controlled access and an uncontrolled access. Like, yeah. So like we have to put up like signs at a perimeter that says, warning, you're entering an RF active environment. <coughs> Contact this number before entering, you know, things like that. Yeah. So we have a display panel that sits on the wall. I have a technician that's about two feet from us when he's working at his desk. So we might want to explore I would, that a I would, bit. I would, I would, I would, I would, I would, move that. I would yeah. move that. So, yeah. Where did this, this calculator you were showing on here? Yeah. Where do you find, where do I find that? That's on the, it's on the ARRL's website. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yes, I got, oh, okay. Yeah. I had a lot to pack onto this slide, so it ended up <laughs> squished the top. Yeah. Are we always, we are I mean, yes. there's never a moment when we're not. Yes. No. You, you, you're always getting RF, but the question is how close you are to the radiating source, right? So with there, there are certain sections of frequency that are potentially more 
damaging than others. And that's why this is kind of a complicated calculation. Because if you go into the background, like there's a whole table based on what frequency you entered, what the controlled and uncontrolled exposure limits are. Because there's, there's a, like if you look at it, it's OET65 is the bulletin. There's a whole table on power and different rates for different frequencies and things like that. Um, you know, and, and so, so again, it goes back to how close you are to the thing. And longer waves transmit longer. So. Across, like nuclear power. <laughs> All right. We got it. It's 840. I, I wanted to be done no later than this. So um, thank you for showing up. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All right. Unanimously, we have adjourned at 840. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you, you next time. Yes. 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 Yes.